campus and at North Campus, can we rise to our feet and let's give an applause of thanksgiving to men and women who sacrificed on behalf of all of us. You know, we are uh, the land of the free because we are also home of the brave. Well, listen, you're welcome to be seated. I want to welcome you to Motion Church tonight, everybody. Hello, South Campus. And let's give a shout out to our friends at North Campus. Hey, North Campus. So glad you're with us. So excited to be here. Those online family watching um, from your home, uh, welcome. And we're glad that you're with us. And God is doing some great things locally in our state, in our nation. You know, we, we've got people watching and in touch with our motion ministries all over uh, the world. Uh, we have people in Thailand. Hello. We have people in Mexico. Glad you're with us. Uh, Fresno, uh, Lodi, San Francisco. My relatives live in San Francisco. I hope you're watching. Uh, San Antonio, Shirts, Texas. We got some folks there we want to give a shout out to. Hey, here locally, Edgewood, Everett, Moses Lake, Puyallup, Seattle, South Hill. Welcome, everybody. So glad that you're with us. God is working. May you be blessed while you're with us. So, hey, I've uh, titled my message this evening, It's Power Time. So what time is it? Give a little flex if you want. What time is it? It's power time. That's right. Well, listen, um, God wants us all to be clothed with power. That's his heart. And I want that outfit. You know, there's clothes we can see, but there's also clothes you can't see. And this message is not about fashion statements. It's about being clothed with power uh, from on high. It's a big deal to God that there are no power shortages or power outages in your life and in the church. It's time for his power. Uh, power is a big deal uh, to God. You know, I was at our... Uh, worship night, the beginning of this month, down at North Campus, and uh, I had to uh, stand in the back because the place was packed, yeah. and Pastor Dave at North didn't save me a seat up front. <laughs> Dave, we're buddies. Actually, you know, we are, we're very happy uh, grandpas right now. Uh, yeah. Dave and Renee, just several weeks ago, welcomed their second grandchild, Two days later, everybody, Tan and I welcomed our second grandchild. I think I might have a picture of Callahan John McCartan. There he is, 15 days old. So in this competition, we're tied. Not that everything's a competition, but everything's a competition. You know that. So in about a month and a half or so, thank, thankfully to uh, my daughter-in-law, Brittany McCartan, my son, Michael, Tan and I are going to be welcoming our third grandchild. So we'll be taking the lead. Three to two. Back to worship night. I'm in the back. Love you, Dave and Renee. I'm in the back, and I feel like the Lord said something to me that I want to pass on. And I saw uh, beautiful folks just worshiping. It was a wonderful moment. And I felt like the Lord said, Sean, I am sending three waves through Motion Church. Not that I'm going to send them in the future, but right now, I'm sending these waves through Motion Church. And he said, the first wave that I'm sending is a wave of purity. How many want to ride that wave? And then he says, and the second wave that I'm sending is a wave of holiness. And the third wave that I'm sending is a wave of power. So the first wave of purity washes some things away. Bye-bye. The second wave of holiness washes some things in. The third wave of power shakes some things up. <laughs> so what time is it? It's power time. You can know what the, uh, the time is or the hour is, by looking at your watch, and that's chronos. But you can know what the hour is for by looking to God, and that is kairos. I don't want to just know what time it is, but I would like to know what this time is for. And the time is for his power in you, in me, in us. God wants to display his power. We're going to talk about what that uh, looks like as well in 
Peter teaches on power. It's in 2 Peter uh, chapter 1 and verse 3. And it simply says this, and this is for you and I. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life. His divine power has given us what? Everything we need, not just for a life or my life, but for a godly life. We have everything we need from where? His divine, not our power, but his divine power. So listen, if you have a need for a godly marriage or godly changes or godly lifestyle or godly habits, there's power for that. Everything you need for a godly life, God provides uh, through his power. And power is a big deal in God's eyes. Why? Well, the devil is working to do what? Wear us down and wear us out. And so God gives us two types of divine power. When the devil's trying to wear us down, he gives us dynamite power, which is explosive power. And when the devil's trying to wear us out, he gives us dynamo power, which is enduring power. So listen, everybody. There is power for today, and there is power for tomorrow. There's power to start well. There's power for staying well. And there's power to finish well. I'm so excited about that. And that's for all of us. Here at South and North and those online, it's power time. Colossians 1 says this, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience. I want that. So Jesus wants to give us his power. Are you wearing down? Are you wearing out? It's a power issue, and there's power for you. So I want to describe five characteristics, if I could, of a powerful person in the Lord. I'd like to describe what his divine power looks like, and maybe it'll inspire you. Maybe give you vision for tomorrow. Give you some goals on how to be a person of his divine power. Because I believe that's what the hour is for. That's what the time is for, his power. Are you ready? Five characteristics of a powerful person. Number one, here we go. A powerful person has an exceptional mindset to start off with. There's God's power and then there's the way we think. (laughs) God wants to think in such a way where it's conducive for his power to occupy your life. And so we want to have an exceptional mindset. Now listen, to be exceptional is not a proclamation that we are better, but it is a proclamation that we are different. And God is a God of exception. God's people, you and I, will experience power differently. And we will exert power differently. Exception, it means a deviation from what is normal or popular. Are you ready to be different? To be an exception as you are a person of his divine power. So we will experience his power differently from the norm or what is popular. As a rule, most people do not experience a wilderness and come out better unless you're an exception. As a rule, most people do not experience a lion's den and exit without a scratch, unless you're an exception. As a rule, most people do not experience a fiery furnace and come out smoke-free, unless you're an exception. And as a rule, most people do not experience death and burial and bust out of the grave three days later, unless you're an exception. We are exceptional because of God's exceptional power. So we experience it differently, and we also exert his power differently. This is how we think about it, and Jesus teaches us how to think about it. Are you ready? It's Mark chapter 10. He's teaching his disciples about power. (laughs) They need some help. So do we. In calling them to himself, Jesus said to them, you know that those who are recognized as rulers or people of power of the Gentiles, they, they use that power to lord it over them, and they wear people down, and they wear people out. That's how the Gentiles or people in the world are using or utilizing their authority or their power, and their great men exercise authority, how? Over them. But 
It is not so among you. Why? Because you're an exception. That's what not so among you means. You're different. You're different from what everybody's doing, what's popular, or what is the norm. Research tells us that the more powerful a person becomes, the worse of a person they can become. An article for the Wall Street Journal noted that most of us are nicer as we're climbing the social ladder, the flagpole, the food chain. But once we get closer to the top, the article says, we start acting like a beast. They concluded when you give people power, they basically start acting like fools. (laughs) They flirt inappropriately, tease in a hostile fashion, and become totally impulsive. The researcher concluded even the most virtuous people can be undone by the corner office, (laughs) but not so among you. See, we don't do power the way the world does power. We do it differently because we have an exceptional mindset. Here's the difference. Power from the world will primarily be used to make yourself better. Power from God will primarily be used to make others better. Are you ready to make others better? God will empower you to build up folks. So it starts with how we think about it, having an exceptional uh, mindset. Characteristic number two, you ready? A powerful person does not seek to impress others, like I've done for many years, (laughs) trying to impress people. That comes out of insecurities, which comes out of a lack of power. What I'd rather do is instead of trying to impress people temporarily so that you think about me, I'd rather impact you eternally so you think about Jesus. So that's, that's the goal. A powerful person knows that power is delegated power, so it's humble power. You won't see a person full of pride and full of God's power simultaneously. It's going to be one or the other, okay? The Bible does not say God gives power to the powerful. It says in Isaiah 40 that God gives power to the weak. So weakness... Embracing weakness that we might become powerful for God. It's a theme throughout the Bible. Here's what uh, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4. He says, but we have this treasure in what? Jars of clay or clay pots, uh, earthen vessels. Pretty ordinary, folks. To show that this all-surpassing power is from where? God. Not from us. Paul later went on to say, my, God spoke to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, Paul, for my power is made perfect in weakness. The treasure and power of the Holy Spirit travels in weak containers, everybody. <laughs> Paul did not mention bronze, metal, shiny, titanium, or carbon fiber pots, but the treasure is in clay pots. It's you and I. See, a clay pot is not designed to to impress, but it is designed to carry what is impressive. The attention is not on the pot, but what's contained in the pot. And so a truly powerful person gets a little uncomfortable with drawing attention to itself because this clay pot knows where the treasure of the power comes from and doesn't want to confuse the two, correct? Correct? So here's the good news about weakness. Every, nobody's disqualified by weakness. See, everybody can be powerful on their own, but, but not everybody, you know, not everybody can be powerful on their own, excuse me, but everybody can be weak on their own. So nobody is disqualified from experiencing the divine power of God. Do you have weakness in your life? Are you weak? You're in, baby. <laughs> <laughs> you qualify to be a person that experiences his power. You know, weakness, and some of you might need to get this. You haven't been powerful in your life because you haven't yet embraced weakness. And the Lord might be reaching out to some of you, your white knuckling life, you're doing it in your own strength. And God's saying, just would you surrender a bit? Would you embrace your weaknesses? Because then you're going to experience uh, my power. 
And as soon as you recognize where your power ends, you'll be quicker to engage his power that has no end. (laughs) Doesn't that sound better? So maybe the Lord's been putting you in a situation where you feel weak. That's not a bad thing because it could mean a transition where you're going to be somebody that's going to tie in to his power saying goodbye to doing in your own strength. Now, here's what I love about a church, a powerful church that embraces weakness. It's an approachable church because we're not comparing pots. It's not a pot competition where we're trying to impress everybody. We're actually celebrating weakness because we know where the strength is, and it's level ground at the cross. And I love being a part of this family because we are approachable, we encourage one another, we build each other up because we know where the power comes from. It comes from him. Come on. All right, ready for number three? A powerful person shares a message of power. A powerful person shares a message of power. Now, you know, Jesus, there were many teachers in his day, but he was different. He was exceptional because people would say, and they were amazed, you know, he, he, he preaches like he's got power and authority, not like everybody else. Here's what it said about the early church as well. Acts 4.33, with great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. God's power and declaration about Jesus go together. (laughs) If you've been silent about Jesus, it's a power issue. (laughs) And God is calling us to share a message of power by his power about him who is powerful, and that is Jesus. You may say, well, I'm not the greatest speaker, communicator, and it's kind of hard for me to talk, and I'm an introvert. I'm part... Part of me, I want to say, perfect. God's, you know, because God wants to empower you beyond your own natural capacity. I was led to Christ by an introvert. Doesn't talk much. So when he did share with me about Jesus, I saw God very clearly. Because I knew it wasn't necessarily natural to him, but I saw God's presence. So we share a powerful message. Listen, if you want a message that the Holy Spirit will use... Just make sure the central premise is Jesus. And the Holy Spirit loves to empower messages about the Son. Okay? Even when we feel weak, the message is powerful and always will be when it's about Jesus. Uh, I remember uh, years ago, it was a Monday, I was pastoring a church and we had multiple services. And Mondays are when pastors go into hibernation. Low-level brain activity, you know, uh, don't talk much, grunt, but we're recovering, right? And so I'm with my son, Michael, and uh, we are at a Wendy's at lunch, and uh, we're just eating, we're not talking, um, and all of a sudden, I see these three uh, gentlemen walk into Wendy's, and I think the Terminator, uh, as a construction worker, (laughs) So three of these construction workers walk into Wendy's, you know, muscles, big work boots, tool belts, hard hats, rugged, studly dudes, right? Even sunglasses, intimidating. And so I, I glance at them, and then I go back to my cheeseburger. And when I'm eating my cheeseburger, I, I, I hear the Lord say, hey, Sean, I want you to go tell them I know who they are. And I really love them. And I say, Lord, it's my day off. <laughs> plus, plus, Lord, I think they'll hurt me. <laughs> and so I am wrestling quietly over this, not saying anything. And then finally I surrender. I say, okay, I'll try. And so the first thing I said, I go, Michael, uh, go wait in the car. <laughs> True story. This, this could get ugly. Go wait in the car. And so there they are. They got their food. And I walk over there in my little J.C. Penney track suit. <laughs> Seriously. Not feeling strong. Feeling very weak. So I just do exactly what he tells me. I don't embellish. I don't add illustrations. There's not an opening and a closing. I just I stick to the script. So I said, excuse me, gentlemen, 
Uh, Jesus wants you to know that he knows who you are and he really loves you. The first two guys wanted to throw their French fry at me, I could tell. I made no impact whatsoever. I kind of backed away. (laughs) I look at the third guy, and guess what? He's got a tear running down his cheek. Was I powerful? Absolutely not. Was the message of Jesus and his love for them powerful? In like five seconds, some studly Terminator construction worker starts crying because God did something. I did not follow up, I'm being honest, and I (laughs) just went back to my car. But I'll never forget the message of Jesus, everybody, can touch deep in people's hearts, no matter what layers or hurts or pain. So here's what I've learned. I would rather have a strong and powerful message while being a weak and ordinary vessel rather than having a weak and ordinary message while trying to be a strong and powerful vessel. Powerful people have a powerful message. Number four, you ready? A powerful person commands spirits. A powerful person commands spirits. I'm feeling a little bossy. I think the church should get a little bossy. Not with people, but with spirits. Because that's what Jesus did. You will not catch Jesus really commanding and forcing people to do something beyond their will. But you will catch him doing it with demons and with spirits. And, and some of us, you know, we like to be powerful by bossing people around. That's not powerful. That's powerless. Let's boss some spirits around. That's true power. And I think that's what time it is, is to experience this type of power. Jesus solved many problems by casting out the spirit behind the problem. For instance, a man was disrupting a gathering at a synagogue. You'll find this in Mark chapter 1, uh, 25 and 26. And Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The impure spirit, the impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him, yay, with a shriek. Jesus was bossing around some spirits solving some problems by casting out the spirit causing the problem. That's power. (laughs) That's real power. Uh, It happened in the church as well through Paul. This is in Acts 16. And this is a a woman who's been following them, and she's possessed with a, a spirit. And if you look at the Greek word, it's literally the Greek word python, so a python spirit. And you think about what pythons do. They suffocate and strangle. So she is possessed with this spirit and harassing Paul. Possession, harassment, whatever, it's all got to go. Day after day, she continued to do this until Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit indwelling her, I command you in the name of Jesus, the anointing one, to come out of her when? Now. At that very moment, the spirit came out of her. Now, this spirit is multitasking, possessing this woman, harassing believers, but again, either way, Demonic activity needs to encounter the power of God through the church, through you and I. Why? To set people free. How many people are suffocating and being strangled by spirits? I think it's happening more often than we might think. I don't want to overbake this point. Everything's a demon. But I think we probably underestimate demonic activity that is strangling and suffocating. We have this rise of mental uh, health issues, and it's not just a medical issue. It's a spiritual issue. And I think our society is infested with demonic activity and spirits, but we have authority through Jesus, the anointed one, to get a little bossy. Get a little bossy. That's power. People need to be set free. Uh, In this last 60 days or so, um, after Sunday morning service, I have this little uh, high school community group developing. I literally meet with these four high school students. They come up to me after church, and we have like a little group. It's wonderful. I did youth ministry for 10 years. It brings me back. And it started when this sweet girl brought her friend, 
and they came up for some prayer. And uh, this one girl asked for prayer concerning chronic depression, chronic physical problems, and chronic self-harm behavior, cutting herself. I asked permission if I could share this. And so I grabbed uh, immediately a lady deacon, Pam. She's here. I go, Pam, come help. (laughs) So we prayed over this precious girl, and uh, we got a little bossy. We said, hey, get out of here in the name of Jesus. Get off of her. You you know, you spirit of depression, self-destructive behavior, tormenting this precious girl. Get out of here. And we invited God to do some other things and bring in his presence, his love, his grace, his peace. So we prayed. Next week, I see her. She comes up after Sunday service and she says, hey, I haven't done any self-harm behavior in a whole week. Come on, everybody. It even gets better. The next week, I haven't cut myself in two weeks since we prayed. Every week she comes up so far and said, I'm not doing any self-harm. I think something happened in the spirit. Getting a little bossy for Jesus, setting folks free. Powerful person commands spirits, okay? Because here's the thing is we have, we have the Holy Spirit, okay? Then we have our spirit, because we are body, soul, and spirit. Then we have spirits, fallen angels. Here's what we don't want to have happen. These spirits affect our spirit because we don't have the spirit. But we want to have the spirit that affects our spirit, so we command spirits. That's the plan. That's the plan. Okay, number five. A powerful person loves the unloving. I heard God tell me, tell Motion Church, it's time to love your enemies. That's power, everybody. Listen, uh, Jesus loved so many people that did not love him back. God doesn't wait to love you until you love him. (laughs) God loves people who hate him. Jesus taught this in Matthew 5. You've heard the law that says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say, love your enemies. Because if you only, if you love only those who love you, what reward is there for that? Even corrupt tax collectors do that much. See, there's uh, easy love and there's difficult love. Easy love is you love me, I love you. Difficult love is you're ugly to me, I love you. What time is it? It's time for difficult love that requires his power. It's going to change the world. I think this divine love that loves the unloving, that makes situations and people ugly, is a power that gets the ugly out of people and out of situations. I think we ought to love the ugly out of the world. (laughs) God's love can do that. I've seen it. I've experienced it. You're going to have ugly situations in life. Some of you have some ugly situations right now. You got some folks, they are not nice. They are not loving. And God wants to empower you to love them in a powerful way, and watch that ugly say bye-bye. The ugly leaves, but the people stay, (laughs) okay? Um, Ugly is not physical. Ugly is spiritual. People are beautiful. The second day of my honeymoon, everybody, uh, found uh, Tan and I, and she's getting nervous right now, (laughs) uh, found Tan and I at a beach in L.A., And uh, she was uh, laying in the sun on her uh, towel uh, in her little swimsuit. I was doing what any normal, healthy, well-adjusted, 19-year-old, God-loving man would do. Three things, uh, hovering, staring, and drooling. I mean, isn't that about right? 35 years later, not much has changed. There's only one thing that could take me away from tan, 
and it's hoops, basketball. <laughs> because we're not just on any beach. We're at Venice Beach. And behind me is not just any basketball court. It's a court at Venice Beach. It's like the West Coast Rucker Park. And a big bucket list item of mine is to get on Venice Beach and play some hoops with the brothers. You know what I'm saying? So I go, honey, I'll be right back. She says, thank God. <laughs> so I go over to the basketball courts, and I wait, and I wait, and I wait, and finally I get on. Yes, I'm playing hoops. I'm having the time of my life. My new wife of three days over there in her little swimsuit, and I'm playing hoops in Venice Beach. And I was the only Caucasian on the court. Everybody was so welcoming and friendly, except for one guy. The guy that was guarding me. I wasn't getting the love. Well, the game started. I got a rebound. And I got punched in the back of the neck really hard. I was having the time of my life. And now I'm scared for my life. I turn around and it's him. And he's ready. And listen, I hadn't had a chance to be annoying yet. I can be annoying, but we just started. And so we continued to play, and, and the other guys were sticking up for me. Hey, leave him alone. But we're playing. He's extra physical and not in a good way. And then we're running for a loose ball, and we're running out of bounds, and it's kind of one of those things that whoever gets there first, you turn around in midair, and you throw it at your opponent at their legs, and then it bounces out, so it's your ball. Do you get that? So we're running. He beats me to it. He gets it, and instead of throwing him at my legs, he throws it right at my face. And it was a good throw because he got me right here. My face just caught on fire. And then the ball bounced way out into the beach. So I go out there, watery eyes, really surprised, not sure what to do. And I'm like praying. And I'm a fairly new Christian. I'm like, Lord, what do I do? What time is it? You know, is it time for my power? Because I just watched Karate Kid. I had some options. <laughs> Seriously. I could, I, could have take, I could have taken him. But I, but I felt like the Lord said, I heard one word, love. So I got the basketball. And when you have the basketball, it's like having the microphone, right? So I'm checking it in, and he's right there. And I said, hey, I just want to tell you one thing. God loves you, and so do I. And I hand him the basketball. Guess what? Ugly left his face softened up his countenance. I didn't see, I didn't see rage. I didn't see anger. I saw this softness. He didn't punch me again. <laughs> he actually was like semi-friendly. After the game, he came up to me and he apologized. He said, I don't know why I, I'm so full of anger and, and rage. So that happened decades ago. But it sets something in the core of my soul that God's love works. God's love works. And so now I'm, I'm jazzed on hostile, ugly situations. I feel alive. If you've got a hostile situation that's ugly, send me in, coach. I love it. I feel like I'm alive, and I'm going to go in there with the love of the Lord, and we're going to get that ugly right out of there. Send me into a crisis. I feel alive because of his love. Well, listen, I'm going to invite you to uh, close your eyes as we, we close this evening and just believe that the Lord wants you to be clothed with power. And the way that you and I receive power, it's all the same. Power is not a philosophy or a thing. Uh, it's a person. It's Jesus. And the Bible says, to as many as received him, John 1, he gave them the right, the power to be called children of God. And listen, maybe you've come tonight and you've been thinking about Jesus. Maybe Jesus has been around you through friends and family and people. But maybe this is the night where Jesus isn't just around you, but Jesus is in you. Because he is the source of the power. Amen? Well, listen, uh, I'm going to count to three. 
And uh, at three, you're going to hear the word now. And that word now could be the very thing that triggers you to lift up your hand. And by lifting up your hand, you're activating your faith and you're saying yes to Jesus. And you're receiving Jesus into your life as your Lord and Savior. And you're receiving his power, his strength, his love, his authority will be deposited you through a relationship with him. And that is for you. So listen, one, two, three, now lift your hand up to the Lord and say, Jesus, I'm receiving you this very evening. Yes, God bless you, come on. Let's welcome them, receiving Jesus, receiving his power at North Campus, online saying yes to Jesus, as saying yes to his power. Come on, let's stand up now. Let's stand up together. Let's worship. Let's thank God. Let's celebrate. And let's surrender and receive the power of the Holy Spirit as we worship. Let's lift this up. We sing, come.